do you have any of these symptoms? Sore throat, throat infections, tonsillitis, constantly, no matter what, you get rid of it, it comes back, all these issues, hoarseness of the throat, loss of voice, constant clearing of the throat, <clears throat> like that, constantly doing that, um, coughing, constant little dry cough, not a big respiratory type cough, runny nose, allergic rhinitis, ear infections called otis media, tooth decay, gum disease, asthma, and respiratory infections. If you have any of these, or a combination of any of these, and in particular the, the short-term ones at least, occur during the daytime, then you've probably got something called LPR, laryngeopharyngeal reflux. It's very common. It's also called extraesophageal reflux disease, EERD, and of course, my favorite one for explaining to people, it's silent reflux. It's very, very closely linked to reflux. And it's very, very common. In fact, I had it about eight years ago. So I was doing touring around the country, all about gut health, and all of a sudden I lost my voice. You know, I was going, <clears throat> I can't really speak, you know. It would be a real strain. So I looked into it, I went to see some specialists, and guess what? No one was able to diagnose it. I paid lots and lots of money. Got all, I went to a speech pathologist who, who said that it was all in my head and rubbish. It was actually in my throat. Um, so I did go back to that speech pathologist. My message was, it's very hard to diagnose. But when you look into the science of it over the last 10 years, there's a lot of really good research coming out about what it is, how frequently it occurs, and it actually occurs in a large number of people. Estimates vary literally between 10 and 60% of the population. So 60% was the German population, but I have no doubt in Western societies, it's up to that 40, 50% level. It's, it's huge. I, I notice it all the time now that I know it. 75% of people with reflux have it. And remember, it's silent reflux. It's related to reflux, which is why I'm going to emphasize you watch my video on uh, reflux. Uh, the, the links are down below because it's part of the solution as well. Um, 50 to 60 percent of the people who have laryngitis, who you know, literally lose their voice, and something like 50 percent of the people with ear, nose, and throat infections uh, are, are literally going because they have LPR. And the biggest figure was 95 percent of ear infections. Are LPR. That's why the use of antibiotics is so ineffective in that group. Now that's children, remember, in a lot of cases like this. They give them antibiotics, it worsens the gut issues, it comes back, the reflux, the silent reflux, LPR comes back, they get the ear infections, more antibiotics, and so on. Rather than treating the condition, which I'm, I'm, I'm about to explain to you, but um, some really simple strategies can make a big difference in reducing the risk of LPR because in the long run, it's also associated with more severe conditions like Barrett's esophagus and esophageal cancer in the long run. Fortunately, as I said, there's lots of things we can do to fix it. What happens when you eat food, you chew it up and you release saliva. When you release the saliva, it's got bicarbonate in it, sodium bicarbonate to alkalize the food so that if it's a little bit acidic, it neutralizes it, and that's the idea. And I'll, I'll show you later on how to test your saliva. Very important in the in case of LPR. So you chew the food, it goes down your esophagus, into your stomach, and in your stomach, it, it's acted on by the hydrochloric acid, which is released from your stomach cells, and pepsin. And together, they break down all the proteins. Now the problem occurs when for some reason it goes up through this sphincter at the top of your stomach called your LES, lower esophageal sphincter. And this ring of muscle, this sphincter there holds on and lets food through, but it's not supposed to let some up. So maybe it's not got the right tone or something's a little bit wrong with it. We'll touch on that in a moment. But what happens is it goes back up, goes up in the, into the, uh, literally into the cells of the esophagus where the hydrochloric acid does damage to the actual cell lining. So it'll, it'll start to literally burn it as hydrochloric acid would. But if we take a little cross section here, and this is the cell one cell lining thing, what happens is the pepsin from the stomach can get embedded in the actual cells. So 
That means that any time the conditions are right, pepsin will start digesting and we don't want it to. And with that happening, it leads to an increased oxidation and inflammation. And as a result, the same with the hydrochloric acid, more mucus being produced. And that's a <clears throat> the constant clearing of the throat, the sore throat, the damage. And of course, the pepsin and the hydrochloric acid going up right, right up into the areas of the ears and the eyes. You can, it can be detected in about 30% of the people from their um, tears and so on, uh, ears, all those signs and symptoms I've already described to you. And it's a result of that. Now, fortunately, we also have a bicarbonate store in those cells. So it prevents or tries to reduce the impact of hydrochloric acid. But the question is, how good is your bicarbonate store? And we'll look into that in a moment. So that kind of explains what happens. Now, the critical thing is here is pepsin. That seems to be the molecule we really want to focus on. So what happens with pepsin? Well, this is a little graph. Now, excuse the science, but you'll understand it when I go through it. What happens is this is literally the pH. And the pH goes from 0 to 40. And here we've got up to 10. And this is pepsin. This is the, the molecule, the enzyme in the stomach, and the one that got stuck in our cells, in our esophagus, which digests, and we don't want it to, in the esophagus. And we find that at a pH of 2, which is really acidic, and that's what your stomach is supposed to be, about two. It breaks down everything perfectly. And you can see it gets less and less effective. This, this black curve here is, shows you that as the pH goes up and it becomes neutral at seven, it's no longer active. Six, no longer active. And eight, no longer active at all. But what happens, this blue line, and this is the critical one, it shows that at eight, Pepsin is broken down. So this is a stability curve. At a pH of 8, and this is really, really critical, at a pH of 8, pepsin is broken down. So if pepsin is causing a problem in your esophageal cells and you want it to break down, we have to somehow, I'll show you in a moment, make sure the pH of everything around there is 8 or more. So it stops the action of pepsin, therefore it stops the production of the mucus, the digestion, the mucus, and halts LPR. What to do to fix the problem? Starts with, first of all, assuming you've probably got reflux. And check my channel out on YouTube. Check it out because there's a lot of good information and science what you, do, you can do there that's really been shown to be effective. Uh, a lot of similarity actually overlap you'll see in a moment. However, the first thing is in that program I'm recommending uh, apple cider vinegar, don't take it as a liquid for obvious reasons. It will re-stimulate the pepsin, which is what you don't want in this case. So what you do is you can take it as a capsule or hydrochloric uh, acid betaine as a supplement, okay, but not as a liquid, which we know. So what's the YouTube absolutely must? Then what we're after is looking for things, and I'll repeat some of this in from the reflux program, but there are things that can um, play havoc with the tone of the LES and the LES remember is the sinker at the top of your stomach which allows things down when you want it and shouldn't let things up and things can change that tone lessen that tone and make it possible for a little bit to get up and that's probably what is happening in LPR a little bit's getting up not a lot to cause that irritation and that feeling of heartburn and reflux but enough to cause some damage up there and the pepsin to be embedded into the epithelial lining so things like caffeine chocolate smoking alcohol Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. These are aspirin. These are whole rafts of the drugs that people take for um, uh, stopping inflammation and the headaches and pain and aches and things like that. Uh, a major player in this and they can all uh, lessen the tone. And so it's really important to understand that, that that may be causing it. Then you've got stress. Your esophageal sphincter is run by your balance between your relaxation nervous system and your uh, activated nervous system and if you're too activated and too stressed and worried about things and so on then your sympathetic nervous system takes over and it can affect the tone and literally the opening and closing of of your les your lower esophageal sphincter you've also got food intolerances always be conscious of that in the background and i mentioned that in in the um information on the reflux 
then sugar. Sugar is a definite no-no. You want to get rid of these problems. You want to get rid of most of the problems, in fact. Get rid of sugar. Oh, I can't. I'm addicted to it. Change it. You're not addicted to it. The toxic microbiome is. Your toxic microbiome is actually causing you to be addicted to sugar. So change it around. Take control. Take control. Then we've got what we want to do now. So that's the basics. Then we've got the pe pepsin deactivation. And that it means about building up your bicarbonate store, making sure you've got enough. And I'll show you in a moment how to do a quick test to see what your bicarbonate store is. But again, I have a video on bicarbonate. It's my, my most popular one. And uh, check out the one on bicarbonate because it'll explain how it all interacts. And this is so important. It's not just for, for uh, reflux or LPR. It influences so many things around the body, your body's ability to deal with viruses, for example. So check out that video. It's really, really important. And uh, so we want to build up and check out the bicarb store, and I'll show you how to do that. Then we've got two little ingredients, the tryptophan, which is an amino acid, goes to form melatonin, well, serotonin and melatonin. And that, you ready? Alters permeability, so whether or not the pepsin can get in and things can get in and through. Motility, moving things out of the esophagus, which is what you want. Antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, which is what you want as well, because with all that damage being done there, if you want to stop it transitioning into something more serious, then you want antioxidants and anti-inflammatory nutrients to be able to get to those places where the damage is done. And finally, we're going to do that. Um, we're going to repair and protect by making sure that there are some antioxidants and anti-inflammatory nutrients that have been shown to work with LPR and reflux and so on. The next step then is to do a pH test of your saliva and urine. And the idea is you're trying to get your saliva pH close to seven. Now already some other people have been doing this since I've been publishing the information on bicarbonate store and bicarbonate and check out the video on that. It will really help you understand this. And uh, um, people have said, look, it's a five or six. What do I do? And I said, well, just keep doing it. All you do is you get the paper, put a little spit into a spoon or your hand, and then leave it there for five or 10 seconds. Now the pH paper itself will cost you about $10 online. I found the cheapest places are online and you get a range from ideally four till about nine, but uh, any range will do. But the narrower the range, four to nine, the more accurate it's going to be. And as I said, it's gonna cost about $10 online. And so you compare the colors then, what happened, changes that occur on the pH paper with the scale that they've got on the packet. And you go, oh, okay, so my pH today, and it won't vary from day to day, your pH of your saliva will, mine is 6.75 to seven, which is the perfect, perfect range you wanna get it to. 6.75, 6.5, and a little bit up if you can. Now, your urine is slightly different. That will vary up and down all day, depending on what you've eaten. So uh, if you want to test your urine, test it first thing in the morning. And the ideal scenario is both of them, first thing in the morning, will be about 6.75, around about that range. But your urine one will vary, as I said. It uh, is affected a lot by what you um, eat and drink. Whereas your saliva pH is affected by your bicarbonate stool. So it's the best and simplest indicator if you've got enough bicarbonate store. And if you don't, then what you want to do is look at the bicarbonate, uh, sodium bicarbonate video I've got and start using some to get that store back to normal. So with that in mind, the next step then is to say, okay, well, I need to build up my bicarbonate store. And the way you can do that is simply by having a half a teaspoon of sodium bicarbonate mixed in with water first thing in the morning. And that's the simplest, fastest, easiest way to do it. And that will take months, okay? It'll take months to get up to where you want it to be. Uh, if, you, if you're already in the seven range, you're already up there, then you don't need to do this. Uh, however, the next thing you want to do is also drink, make sure your drinks are always greater than a pH of eight, eight or a pH of eight. And you can go and get some uh, special waters that have uh, a mineral, content in them and their pH is eight. But mineral water, and I tested some mineral waters yesterday, and they were around about five. Your soft drinks are around about uh, three. Um, they're very acidic, they're gonna, they're gonna stimulate the pepsin and cause havoc 
with the, 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 the pain and aches in there. So anything, um, then you got your wine, coffee and tea. They're all going to do the same. However, however, if you want your coffee and tea, and I'm not sure this will work with wine because I haven't tried it, but in your tea, you can put just a smidgen of sodium bicarbonate. Now, what's a smidgen? A smidgen is literally that much on a spoon. And you mix it in with your coffee and tea. That will alkalize the water to a pH of around about eight and therefore help neutralize. So what you're trying to do is drink as many drinks as possible through the day, slowly sipping, slurping, gurgling, anything that's going to hold it in there a little bit longer so that the pH 8 water can deactivate the pepsin. So the simple strategy is you want to deactivate it, and that's where sodium bicarb, just a little bit in, in your drinks. If you've got normal tap water, the pH of the tap water is probably 6 or 7. It's not going to exacerbate the problem, but it's going to fix it. So you just put a smidgen, again, just this amount in. Now you don't need to do the bicarbonate drink. I hope you can see that little bit in there. Um, you don't need to do the bicarbonate drink if you're doing this a couple of times a day. And this way you can get all the all the drinks that you want to. Uh, and, and it's going to start fixing the pepsin that's embedded. It's going to deactivate the pepsin. That's what we're trying to do. So with that in mind, we've got, we, we know we're not going to do any of these drinks. And the research shows that probiotics and prebiotics work for a lot of the conditions. So whether it's tonsillitis, otis media, your ear infections, throat infections, and so on. And your esophagus and your stomach as well have a, a microbiome. So what you want to do is build up that microbiome because it looks after the epithelial lining. It looks after the cells of the top there. They're the keepers of it, so to speak. Only smaller amounts by compared to the large intestine. So taking probiotics, bifidobacteria, uh, so that's bifidobacteria and lactobacillus, the typical ones that you get in yogurt. Yogurts aren't enough, although you can get high uh, probiotic yogurts and you can also put some of the powder in your yogurt if you want to do that. Now, the trick here with any of the drinks and any of the foods and any of the prebiotics and so on is you want it to stay there as much as possible. So just, you know, sipping is going to be the best bet. But there is another ingredient that I want to add and it's called slippery elm. Again, uh, available online from your health food store, uh, some of the major uh, supermarket sellers. Slippery Elm is fantastic. It's antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and it has uh, healing properties for the esophagus. And it forms a gluggy little layer. So it's a little bit hard to take sometimes, but you get a little bit and you mix it in with a little bit of water and you can mix some other things in there if you want to make up your own concoction. And then you just, again sip on that during the day and it puts a little coating on the top of your esophagus and also with the water being a pH of 8 holds it in there and has um very is it's been shown to be very effective in everywhere around the gastrointestinal tract except the esophagus so there are no studies i can find on it at the moment however the same principle applies for the, the rest of it so having a little bit of sip of uh, some slippery elm liquid is brilliant. Then the last thing is we want to add some antioxidants. And the antioxidants that have come up in the literature include curcumin, so that's turmeric, and what, what are called the proanthocyanidins, but also known as grapeseed extract. So taking lots of antioxidants, anti-inflammatories, uh, if you've got a powder of it, you can mix it in actually with your slippery elm, if you're not a, a supplement, because ultimately everything that gets taken into the body gets out to the cells on the outside as well. So uh, I would highly recommending up your antioxidant and anti-inflammatory because they're the ones that are gonna rebuild and look after it. Now, finally, there are two products on the market and they come up with about a 50% success rate. Better than proton pump inhibitors, which don't address the problem, but they, these ones do begin to address the problems and they're a combination of hyaluronic acid and chondroitin sulfate. And the combination of those is in these two products, uh, Gerdoff and Essox, uh, which you can get online as well. I've checked that out. There are two possibilities for you to use as a, as a last resort if you want. But what they don't have, I've got so much more in all of this information here. So take it away. Check out the other YouTube channels. Start the program straight away, mixing a little bit of sodium bicarb in. And good luck with me. Please, please let me know how you go.